saying hello, John, and welcome to Wellington School. Um, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed with us. Uh, we're here to talk about careers in languages. So could you give us a little introduction to yourself, please? Right. Thank you, Mrs. Ramson. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my name is John Stedman. I'm many things. I'm an author of a book called The Language Secret. I run my own language services business. I live in Bavaria, in southern Germany, between Munich and the Alps, and I'm 60 years old. Fantastic, thank you. And um, what did you study at university? Well, the bad news is I didn't actually get to university. Uh, in my generation and in my social class, I, I never actually met anyone who went to university. So young boys of my generation and my age didn't actually get there. So I left school at 16. Um, I did, however, have a sort of gap year. I know that's a, a thing with people before they go to university. I started work and then my wife and I took some time off and we decided to do humanitarian work in Africa. And that's really where our journey with languages began. Right, okay, so what uh, talk, talk us through that journey with languages and, and where it all began. Well, we, I studied languages at school, but it was, I went to a grammar school and everything in the school was geared for intellectual subjects that had no practical application. So for example, we studied something called pure mathematics. And when I asked the teacher, why is it called pure mathematics? He said, well, my boy, it's called pure because it has nothing to do with the real world. And this was the sort of school I went to. It, languages had nothing to do with the real world. I didn't even meet anyone who spoke a language, a lang another language until I was much older. But then um, we decided to do humanitarian work in Africa. First, we went to the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. Then later on, we found ourselves in Congo. And for the first time in my life, I came up against people that didn't speak English. I traveled around Europe to tourist areas and I imagined that everyone spoke English. And of course, that's far from being the case. So what was your approach when you realised that perhaps your communication with them was a little uh, challenging? Well, first of all, I've, I think it's just a question of manners. The first thing is it's bad manners to go to someone else's country and expect them to speak your language. But Brits abroad are, are infamous for that. We, we go and we think if we speak loud enough, then everyone will understand English. So I learned that it's good manners to speak English. And it also opens so many doors. When, when people hear you speak their own language, it has such an effect. And you're so much more effective. Whatever your area of life is, whatever your profession, you can touch them in a way that you can't do speaking English. Hmm. So your, um, the, the first language that you then learned was French. And yeah. how did you go about learning that? Well, it was, it was just... I'd had, I'd studied French at school, but I'd learned, I just, it was conjugation, learning verbs. And we learn things that people don't actually say. So the first thing was just to learn how people actually speak, the general expressions that people use. We were forced into it to an extent because we lived in a home with other volunteers and they were all French speakers. They didn't speak any English. So we were literally forced to learn that language. There were days, I must admit, where, when my wife, my wife cried her eyes out because it was, it was so difficult. But very, very quickly, we learned to put words together and to be able to communicate. And one of the first things you learn is don't be a perfectionist. It's not talking to people in their language. It's not like an exam. You don't have to be perfect. If you can get your point across, that's the very first step. Absolutely, that's such an interesting um, comment. And uh, I know in your book, you make a lot of reference to making mistakes and, and that learning languages is in fact about learning language, about speaking it badly. Um, so that's something that I really enjoyed and something that really caught my eye with your book was the, the concept of speaking something badly is that how you learn it. Um, yeah. We have a motto at Wellington, certainly in our languages department anyway, that um, every mistake you make is progress. And uh, I know that's something that you would buy into as well. Can you talk us through the, the mistakes or perhaps some funny stories of mistakes that you've made? Um, 
Well, for it, um, most languages, it, it's impossible to translate one English word into, into a word in another language. So I remember one day my wife, she was looking for a partner to do something in a particular project. Now, French has two words for partner. And one of the words means marriage partner, life partner, sexual partner. So she, instead of using the right word to, I need a partner for this project, she basically said to this guy, would you marry me or would you sleep with me? So, um, but when you make a mistake, you never forget it. So what your colleagues say is true. She never ever made that mistake. Again, it's, it's imprinted on her mind. Mistakes are a great way to learn. And in order to speak a language well, you have to first start by speaking badly. Absolutely, yeah, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I have some funny stories of my time in Germany as well. Um, <laughs> so you're um, incredibly proficient in languages and uh, call yourself a polyglot, uh, 10 languages I believe you speak. So could you talk us through your language learning journey from um, your experiences in Cote d'Ivoire onwards? Well, um, in Cote d'Ivoire, that was, we were monolingual at that time, we only spoke English. So it took us quite a, a while to get to grips with French. But what you find is once you learn how languages are put together, the logic of them, the next one is even easier and up, so on. It gets easier and easier because your brain makes connections with everything else. So by the time we arrived in Congo, we'd understood something about the concept of, of language families. So languages are grouped in families. And if you know a language in one, one language in a family, it's much easier to learn the others. So for example, French and Spanish are in the same group of the same family. So you have a huge he head start. If you know uh, the, the French word for chanté, a uh, French word for sing is chanté, all the words beginning in CH will begin with C in Spanish. So chante becomes cantar. So CH becomes C. In German, if you see a word in D, danken, denken, daum, dust, all of those words will begin with TH in English. First, think, thank, thumb. So the concept of language families helped us. And in Congo, we discovered all the languages were Bantu. So once you learn the logic of one of these languages, it's very, very easy to learn the others. And so we were used to actually make dictionaries for languages that hadn't been written down before. So from someone that didn't speak any languages, we became proficient in making dictionaries, making language courses, learn, helping people to to read their own language for the first time. Amazing. And um, what are the languages that you speak then? I think I think there are 10, is that right? Okay, I th well, just, just to specify speak, because um, in the introduction to the book, I use the example of Jose Mourinho, who a lot of you will have heard of, the special one. Now, he speaks six languages, but speak, they're speaking and speaking, as you know. So. What that means is he can communicate in six languages. So I prefer to say I can communicate quite effectively in 10. The 10 are English, then I learned French. After that, my next best one is Lingala, which is spoken in Congo, uh, German, Congo, which is another language, Spanish, Larry, which is a language spoken in Brazzaville. Um, where are we? Portuguese, Kituba, and Italian. But there's a few la other languages that I can communicate in, but 10 seem like a, a nice round number for the title. Definitely, fantastic. Okay, so um, you are currently an author. Could you tell us a little bit about the jobs that you have done um, that you found yourself working in thanks to your language skills? Well, thanks to them now, I'm in a position where I have a very varied life and that's one of the great things about languages. So I'm a, a translator, an interpreter, I teach languages as well, and I, and I write. Um, so that's why a typical day, for example, there is no typical day. Some days I will get a phone call for the, from the police and they will say, could you come to the crime scene? We need an interpreter to translate from English to German. 
Or I could get a call from the refugee agency and they say, well, we have a, a Congolese person here who speaks Lingala and they are making an application for residence in German. So could you, could, could you translate from Lingala to German for us? Other days I'm teaching business people who want to improve their English or French or German. Other days I'm, I'm doing my writing projects. So language has opened an incredible amount of doors for me. Wow. Um, could you, I, it might be a difficult question, but could you tell us what is your favorite part of the, the many jobs you do or the favorite job? Um, I think my favorite thing is when, when, when you see the expression on someone's face, for example, in Africa, uh, they see a white person and they would expect them in Congo, for example, to speak French. And they imagine that all white people grow up speaking French, that they don't know that you've made a huge effort to learn that language. But when you speak to them in their own language, it's just an incredible feeling. Um, some, sometimes I've had people just shriek with, with joy. It's literally jumping up and down for joy that uh, they're taught from a very young age, unfortunately, that their language has no value, that it's a primitive language, which is not true. And so when you speak to them in their language, it's as though you're honoring them and giving them dignity. And that's a fantastic thing to be able to do to anyone. Wow, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, what um, is the hardest thing that you've ever had to do in your professional career? Um, there's a couple of things I find hard. Um, first of all, we had to create this dictionary, a language that hadn't been written before. There was no grammar book, there's no classes. We had to literally figure out how this language worked from scratch. That was very hard. But hard in a different way, emotionally hard. Um, sometimes it's at the refugee agency. People have fled their country under terrible, terrible conditions. And they have to go through all these bureaucratic hoops. And the people in the refugee agency, they're just doing their job, but they have to ask a lot of questions. Sometimes it comes across as unkind. And as an interpreter, you, you're meant to be neutral. You're not meant to take a side. You have to interpret exactly what was said and also how it was said. So if the interviewer is somewhat harsh with the candidate, it's very hard to, to rest neutral and, and not soften it in any way. I find that very difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, what in the many things that you have done and probably many countries that you've lived in, what do you think is the coolest thing you've ever been able to do? Well, we, we were sent to a, a city, about half a million people uh, in the Congo, in the center of Congo, and there, are, there were no white people there. We were the only white people in half a million people, no electricity, no running water, and only two paved roads that crossed the city. So the coolest thing, we had a trail bike, and I, I hadn't learned to ride a motorbike until I was 50. So we had to learn to ride this trail bike. And so we were, driving through mud and sand in, in this trail bike and being able to speak to people in their own language. So that was pretty cool. And my wife, she looks quite a biker chick when she's uh, on her trail bike. We've got some pictures of her. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, what is the best bit about speaking the languages that you speak? I think you've kind of touched upon this already, but what would you say is hands down the, the absolute best thing about speaking your languages? I think it's just the way it opens up human relationships. Um, when, when you speak in English, the, the person will communicate with you. If you speak in French or German or Spanish, what you will find is that the, the more prestige the language has, the less effect it has. So for example, French, they are very proud of their language. And, and if you speak French, they will, they will be happy about that. Germans will be even happier because not many people make the effort to learn German. Spanish will be even happier because very few English people speak Spanish. And then the less prestige the language has, the more happy people will be. So 
the best thing is always human relationship. It, it opens doors, smooths the way for many, many things. Yeah. And what advice do you have for any young people who may be thinking, well, that's all very well and good for you, but I just can't do languages? Well, the first thing is, as I, I left school at 16, I couldn't speak another, I couldn't string a sentence together in French or German, nothing. So if I can do it, you can do it. Um, the other thing is, it doesn't depend on your exam results. Maybe, maybe you think I can't do it because my last exam result was very poor. Exams are necessary. So as a teacher, you may not like what I'm going to say now, but <laughs> exams really don't prove your ability in the language. I, I know many people that I've taught, there is a, an international English exam called the TOEIC, and I have taught top executives who have got 900 or more on the TOEIC, which is a very high mark out of a thousand. They can't say anything, but I know other people secretaries who got three or four hundred and they can communicate well so if your exam results are not great don't be discouraged it's not a measure of who you are and it's not a measure of what you can do in language the other thing i'd say is if if you have kids there whose parents speak a different language at home whether it's polish or punjabi don't be ashamed of that embrace that if you speak your parents language not not just if they speak to you in Punjabi, don't reply in English. Reply in Punjabi or Polish or Papiamenta, whatever it is. If you have a language, another language they speak at home, you have a huge advantage and you can use that later in life. Absolutely, yes. And I think, as you mentioned before, once you have learnt one language, whether that's English or another language, um, other languages become much easier to understand and to pick up after that. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, um, I have one final question for you, and that is, if you could sum up language learning in exactly five words, what would they be? Right, I've got a few possibilities, so you can edit this out if you want. I would say, in line with what we said earlier, the, the enemy of language learning is perfectionism. So five words would be, dare to make a mistake. Or, if you don't like that one, you can have learning languages changes your life. Or you can have learning languages expand your brain. All of those are exactly five words. So whichever one you like, you can take that one. But I think dare to make a mistake. That's what you have to do with languages. Absolutely, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I always find it very amusing that when I ask um, linguists to put things into five words, they just can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Love to be verbose. Thank you ever so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Ramsumer, And I hope all your students uh, really enjoy the language learning journey that they're on and it will take them places they could never have dreamed of. So, speak to you soon. Thank you.